Well, our text is really quite brief this morning. It is the first commandment, Exodus 20, verse 3, which says this, You shall have no other gods before me. Well, as I've already mentioned, we've, we've been looking at um, God's purpose for us, uh, why he loved us, why he sent his son to save us, and um, the bottom line is he did it in order that he might make us like Christ. You know, we, we, t- we kind of, um, I think we've probably been a little bit critical of that phrase, which was kind of in vogue a few years ago, uh, what would Jesus do? There's, there's a lot of validity to that. You know, I mean, we really ought to be thinking about that in every situation because what Jesus would do is exactly what the Father wants us to do, which is why we need to, to study Jesus. Remember what Paul writes in Romans eight twenty nine: For those whom he foreknew, which means, again, his eternal for, for loving us and choosing us, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son. Okay, he, he determined that we would be like Christ. That's why he gave us the Holy Spirit, to work his character in us from the inside out. Now, we need to, to realize that Jesus is more than just our Savior. And we were thankful that he is, but he is also our paradigm. He's the living example of what we're called to be. God wants us to be like him to put on his character. And really, that's what Jesus meant when he said to his disciples, follow me. I mean, there were a couple of things he meant, right? He did say, I want you to go where I'm going, you know, so look and see where I'm headed. I want you to follow me in that that respect. But also that they should follow his example. He was calling them to discipleship, and discipleship means sitting under a teacher and learning from that teacher until they become like their teacher. Remember what Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew 10, verse 24, it is enough for the disciple that he become like his teacher. That was their goal. That was the goal Jesus had for them. That is what he desired of them, and that is what he desires of us as well. So we've been looking at the question, what is Jesus like? Trying to answer that. And so far we've seen that, um, as we saw last week, that, um, that he obeyed his, uh, the Lord, he, he obeyed God by loving his Father and showing him that love through his obedience. Remember what he said to his disciples on another occasion in the upper room, that the world may know that I love the Father, I do exactly as the Father commanded me. Now, again, the point there was that Jesus didn't just go around saying that he loved God. He showed that love. James, you know, faith without works is dead. Well, a faith that works by love is is going to do the acts of love or the works of love. And Jesus said here that he does exactly as the Father commanded him. He didn't just obey his Father now and then, but he did it all the time. And his obedience wasn't just, you know, general but precise. You know, the Puritans were were actually criticized as being a precise group of people. You know, you remember that story, I think it was John Rogers, and he was riding by this this wealthy man's house on one occasion, and the the man saw him, and so he, he recognized who he was, this Puritan preacher, and so he gets on his horse, and he rides out after him, and he rides alongside him, and he begins rebuking him, and criticizing him, and, and, um, he, um, he says finally to him as he kind of settles down a bit, he goes, tell me, Mr. Rogers, why, why are you so precise in your obedience and in your insistence on obedience to God? And John Rogers said, because, sir, I serve a precise God. You know, God, uh, he, he desires perfection, and, and perfection is, is a very high calling. And that is exactly what Jesus gave to him this exact obedience. Now, last week we saw an example of this in the fifth commandment where the Lord says, honor your father and your mother. Now, Jesus, we saw as the eternal son of God, did exactly that. He loved and honored his father with his whole heart from all eternity. That's something of the special relationship that the son of God had with the father. 
But we also saw that when he came into the world that he loved and honored his earthly mother and stepfather. He submitted to them and obeyed them when he was a child. He helped Joseph in his trade while he was growing into a man. And when Joseph died, he continued to care for his mother. Even when dying on the cross, one of the last things he did was to make sure that she would be provided for by John. You know, woman, behold your son, and uh, uh, John, behold your mother. Uh, that was his responsibility as the eldest son. And even on the cross, he was concerned about fulfilling that obligation. So again, Jesus is our pattern, okay? This is what we are to do. We are to honor and to love our parents. And even, of course, when they're gone, still to love them and to honor their memory. Now, this morning, I want us to back up to the first commandment. You know, the reason why we jumped ahead, of course, as I said, was because our attention was drawn in that direction. But otherwise, we would have started here, okay? And the first commandment we've already read, you shall have no other gods before me. I want us just to consider for a moment how Jesus fulfilled this. Now, first of all, let's look at the commandment and the context in which it was given to see what it is that God has in view here. Now, we know that on the face of it, that what he's clearly forbidding here is idolatry, okay, the worship of other gods. Now, this is something that really God has given to his people throughout history. Um, I was just thinking about this, that um, God actually gave this commandment to Adam and Eve. Uh, we, we don't see it in so many words, but we do know that when he made Adam and Eve, he made them in his likeness, in his image. And one of the things he gave to them was a knowledge of what was right and what was wrong. And the fact that that knowledge continues throughout the entire human race, that when they do things that are wrong, their conscience convicts them, that, that's really the evidence that we're all made in the image of God. Now, he also, he gave it to them, of course, because of the temptation that he knew that they would face when Satan came in and offered himself as a substitute God. Now, sadly, we know they broke that commandment. They listened to the serpent. They sided with him. They obeyed him rather than obeying God. So, in, of course, failing to obey the Lord in that particular circumstance plunged the whole human race into ruin. Now, he secondly gave it to his people when he delivered them out of Egypt and made his covenant with them. And why did he do that? Well, again, because he would be God. But remember, Egypt, and really the world as a whole, was a land of many gods. And God knew that they would be tempted to cling to them even though he had brought them out of Egypt. Their gods also came with them. And sadly, many of them compromised and fell away. And then, as we know, that generation failed, and so the next generation God was going to bring into the promised land. But before he did, in Deuteronomy chapter 5, he gives them the commandments again as they're about to enter Canaan because he knew there they would be confronted with other gods, the gods of the peoples there, mainly Baal and Asherah. You've, you've probably read about them several times in the Old Testament. They were the pagan god and goddess of fertility. Uh, and the reason why the people worshipped them was because they needed, <laughs> they needed fertility, okay? Uh, they knew their survival would depend on their crops growing. They knew it depended on their animals multiplying. And they knew it also depended on their ability to bear children. Now, God knew that these fertility gods would be their greatest temptation. And by the way, that's one of the reasons why God had Moses write what he wrote in Genesis 1, where he gives us an account of, of the creation of the heavens and the earth to remind us who it is that made the heavens and the earth. It was the true God, who it was who made the plants and who makes them grow. That's, of course, God. He's the one who created the animals and gives them the power to bring forth young. And he is the one who made man and gave him the blessing to procreate. Uh, he wanted his people to remember. Remember that you know, Moses is writing the Pentateuch and he gives it to the people as they're going into the promised land, but he wanted them to remember what James reminds his readers. 
Every good thing and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. They were to look to God to meet their needs, and they were to show their thankfulness to Him by devoting themselves to Him and to His worship. And as to the fact that He wanted them to worship Him exclusively, He says, you shall have no other gods before me or uh, otherwise translated before my face or in my presence. He didn't want to be one among many. He wanted them to love him solely and to have undivided hearts. You know, if you look at the Old Testament, there were times when God's people didn't just, you know, they didn't abandon God, but what they did was they they also worshipped other gods alongside with him, particularly the Baals. They wanted to make sure that they had all of their bases covered in case God didn't come through for them. They forgot one important thing, that God is a jealous God. He says through Isaiah in Isaiah 42 verse 8, I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another, nor my praise to to graven images. Now again, we need to remember that because, um, you know, whatever, whatever, we, whatever we thank for what we have, whatever we trust in for our well-being, you see, those are things that we owe to God. And when we give those things to something else, we're actually committing idolatry. Well, God's people didn't, you know, they, they failed, okay? They, they failed to trust in the Lord and to worship Him as God alone. But, of course, the point of, of the passage we want to look at this morning is Jesus did not fail. Jesus kept this commandment. Jesus devoted Himself to the true God. Now, Satan was the first to challenge Him. Notice that at that very point, He offered to give Him the kingdoms of the world if He would only fall down and worship Him. If Jesus was willing to make Satan his God. Again, the same kind of temptation that was you know, that he presented to Adam and Eve. Are you going to obey me? Are you going to obey God? Well, Dr. Ferguson reminded us last Lord's Day evening that when Jesus answered him, he said this, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. I think Dr. Ferguson had a very interesting point here, which is very useful. He said Jesus didn't say, look, I'm the son of God. I don't have to obey you. You know, leave Satan. But rather, he simply overcame him by submitting to the Word of God, which continually speaks. Okay? The Word of God, Jesus uh, quoted this as the living Word of God, as something that God not only said, but is continuing to say. And as long as Jesus submitted to it, he was safe from the enemy's attacks. You know, if you're going to uh, worship God and serve him only, you're certainly not going to worship and serve this usurper. Jesus knew the right thing to do, and he did it. That is our strongest defense against the enemy. But I want us to look at this for a moment. Jesus was resolute in his commitment, not just to say that this is what man should do, but rather to do it himself. Jesus worshiped and served the true God. Now, I know it sounds strange to say that the Son of God, okay, the one who was actually worshipped by His disciples, the one who is the eternal Son of God and God Himself, that He worshipped God. But as a matter of fact, that's exactly what He did. It, It shouldn't surprise us because we know Jesus was a man as well as God. And as a man, He owed God worship. Sometimes we have difficulty kind of separating these things. But remember, Jesus took the obligation to come into this world and to do what we failed to do in order to become our surety. You know, the idea that he would guarantee for us the blessings of of what we call the covenant of grace, um, which is um, the promise of life if you're perfect. And we know that we fail. Adam and Eve failed. And that's why we cannot gain life through Adam and Eve. But Jesus comes into the world as a second Adam in order to take that same obligation on himself 
And he didn't fail. He did everything that God requires of man, and that includes worship. Jesus devoted himself to worshiping God. Now we need to think about what that means. Well, first of all, we know that Jesus devoted himself to public worship. You know, Jesus, if I were to ask you, how often do you think Jesus went to the synagogue uh, throughout the year, okay, what would you say or what would you think? Wouldn't you, wouldn't you think, well, every Sabbath day, Jesus was in the synagogue? I think that that's right. He went there every Sabbath throughout his childhood. His parents were faithful Jews, and they took him to worship. Uh, as a young apprentice to a stepfather when he was a young man. Even after he began his ministry, okay, he was devoted to his father. He was devoted to worshiping the true God. You know, I think the first service that Jesus missed was the, was the Sabbath after his crucifixion. You know, he was in the tomb, and I think he has an excuse in that matter, but he was in heaven worshiping the father at that point, wasn't he? Well, Jesus loved his father, he took him to be his God, and so he faithfully worshipped him. But we understand that that wasn't the extent of his devotion. He worshipped and served his father every day of his life, all day, in everything. Every thought that he thought was, you know, was how he might honor the father. Every word he spoke was for his glory. Every decision that he made, every action he took was to further his plan, his purpose here on earth. You know, worship was not some, it wasn't something that Jesus just did now and again. Worship was his whole life. He was devoted to God. Now, I know that word devotion uh, is kind of tossed around a bit. It might be helpful to, to define that, okay? To be devoted means to be dedicated or to be consecrated. And there's another word we use perhaps a little bit more often than that. It's the word sanctification. Sanctification means to set yourself apart from something, you know, to set yourself apart from sin to God, okay, from what is wrong to what is right. Well, it has other meanings as well. You know, Jesus was set apart from his own pleasure and perhaps seeking his own things to seeking God's pleasure. And really, in seeking the Father's pleasure, that is really where Jesus found his own pleasure. Uh, Jesus, speaking prophetically through David, says this in Psalm 40, verses 6 through 8, Sacrifice a meal offering you have not desired. My ears you have opened. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, Behold, I come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me, I delight to do your will. Oh my God, your law is within my heart. We were reminded, I think it was last, well, not last week, but perhaps the week before, that obeying his heavenly Father was more satisfying to him. You know, more, uh, it, it quenched the thirst of his soul and the hunger of his spirit more than, you know, food and drink would, would quench those um, those physical desires when one is hungry or thirsty. Jesus delighted to do God's will, and it was satisfying to him. You know, we, we read in Scripture that Jesus also delighted in fearing God. You know, that's something we don't often think about, perhaps because we don't understand fear. Jesus was not terrified by his Father, but he gave him that respect. He, he loved it to respect him and to give him the honor that was his. Isaiah 11, verses 1 through 3, Isaiah writes of Christ that a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He delighted in obeying him. He delighted in showing him honor and respect. And Jesus, of course, trusted his Father with his whole life. Uh, all of these are really components of devotion. Jesus, again, speaking prophetically through David, says this, 
in Psalm 22, verses 9 through 10. Yet you are he who brought me forth from the womb. You made me trust when upon my mother's breasts. Upon you I was cast from birth. You have been my God from my mother's womb. This trust that Jesus had in his Father was what enabled him to be able to carry out his will without fear. And even when it came to drinking the cup of suffering, which is something we, well, even Jesus in his humanity recoiled from. That's why he prays in the garden, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass, not because he wasn't willing to do it, but because he had the, you know, the innate, um, well, uh, what do you want to say, that innate uh, principle or desire of self-preservation. Uh, if it's possible that salvation may come any other way, then let it come this way, but nevertheless, Father, not my will, but your will be done. And he was willing to do it because he knew that if the Father said, this is what I want you to do, that even though it might be difficult, he would still give him what he had promised on the other side, the joy of being raised and seeing many more people uh, who were conformed to his image. So Jesus delighted to serve his Father. He delighted in honoring and glorifying him. He delighted in trusting him. Jesus was devoted to God. Now, that's simply to say that Jesus took the true God as his God. And what that means is he devoted his whole life to serve him. He devoted his whole life to worship him. And, of course, the point for us this morning is if we're to follow his example, then that's what we need to do. We need to be faithful in, in our worship, don't we? We need to be faithful in our public worship. Again, asking the question, what would Jesus do? Well, what, what would Jesus do when God calls him to worship him as God calls us week by week to gather on his holy day in order that we may offer to him the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving and so that we might hear his word, so that we might learn from him and that we might be transform. Remember Dr. Ferguson reminded us last Lord's Day evening, as well as the other point that I've already brought up, just how much we need to hear God's Word. And even though, you know, we, we think in our minds, well, I've heard that before, but how easy it is to forget that particular item and forget then to do it, okay? This is one of the other ones that we often forget. The Word of God, Jesus has ordained preaching in His church because it is through the Word that we are sanctified. Sanctify them in your truth. Your Word is truth. This is how we grow in our devotion to Him. By the way, we, we do need that every day, don't we? We need to be in the Word every day so that the world doesn't draw our heart and our affections away from Him. But again, as Jesus gave his whole life to, to his Father in worship, we're to do the same, devoting all that we are to serve him in the same way that Jesus did, seeking in every thought to give him glory, to glorify him in every word, in every decision that we make, seeking to do the will of God in order that we might advance his kingdom. Now, you know, one of the questions that I think we should all be asking ourselves, I certainly ask this of myself, is why do we struggle in this area? Well, the reason we struggle is because we don't keep this first commandment, okay? Our hearts are so often divided. Now, you know, we are not like the Israelites in one sense. We're not, we're not going to be tempted to worship Baal or Asherah, Okay? But we worship the things that are like them. You know, why did they worship Baal and Asherah? They worshiped them because they thought these two gods, God and goddess, are going to take care of my needs. Well, when we begin to look to something other than God to take care of our needs, we've done exactly the same thing. As a matter of fact, anything that we desire more than God or that makes us compromise our devotion to Him is really a violation of that first commandment. And really, one of the most common things that we have to face in this materialistic society is money, okay, wealth, um, 
the security that we think it brings or maybe the pleasure that we believe it can give to us. Well, you know what Paul tells us? That to desire those things is actually idolatry. He writes in Colossians 3 verse 5, Therefore consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. Yeah, whatever we desire more than God becomes an idol to us. And wealth is certainly one of those things, especially when we begin to trust in it, right? doesn't matter how rich we are. We can, we can lose it all overnight. Our only trust, our only hope is God. Another thing that can divide our affections between, you know, God and, uh, you know, well, let's just say um, it divides our affections from God can be people, right? Loving somebody else more than we love God. And that's why Jesus said on one occasion, Luke 14, verse 26, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. You know, this, this is one of the hard sayings of Jesus, isn't it? Because Jesus tells us everywhere we are to love everyone. Well, we are. We are to love our neighbors, ourself. Uh, we are to love, of course, husbands are to love their wives, wives their husbands. There's no question there. So Jesus here is not telling us literally to hate, but is using hyperbole. And what he means by this is when it comes to God or it comes to your spouse, you need to love God far more than any other person, even your children. And he goes on to say, even more than yourself. Even more, he says, than your own life. And that's why Jesus told his disciples, if you're going to come after me, he says, whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. We have to die even to our love for ourselves. Okay? But remembering that that only has to do with our love of pleasure in this life doesn't mean we die to the ultimate pleasure, which we find in God. If we are to be more like Jesus, the point is we need to be completely devoted to the Father. And of course, we need to be devoted to the Son. We need to be devoted to God, the triune God. Now again, God has given us the motive. He first loved us. He's given us the power. He's given us His Holy Spirit. He's given us an example of how we are to do that in His only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. But it's up to us to follow that example, which is what Paul commands the Romans to do, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh with regard to its lust. Every time we compromise, it weakens our ability to do what we are called to do first and foremost, which is to love God and to worship Him and to serve Him. And then my last point is this. I don't know if you read those quotes in the bulletin, but there's certainly one in here that blew my, <laughs> blew my mind, especially because of where it came from. But um, it's the idea that God is a jealous God. He doesn't want our affections divided between Him and anything else. And if we don't put these other loves in their right place, God will do it for us because He loves us. Now, this quote comes from Spurgeon. And if you've read much of Spurgeon, you know that what he emphasizes more than anything else is the grace of God. Well, he's doing the same thing here, but it's just strong language. He says this, his love, that is God's love, is strong, is strong as death towards you, and therefore will be cruel as the grave. Oh, well, that's pretty strong language. He will be as cruel, he will be as a cruel one toward you if you do not love him with a perfect heart. He will take away that husband. He will smite that child. He will bring you from riches to poverty, from health to sickness even to the gates of the grave, because he loves you so much that he cannot endure that anything should stand between your heart's love and him. Be careful, Christians. You that are married to Christ, remember you are married to a jealous husband. Boy, those are, those are strong words, aren't they? But that's what discipline is really all about, isn't it? 
whatever we have, we set up in our lives as an idol that we love and desire more than God, that we trust more than God, you know, that, that's going to take us away from our, our love and our service to Him, God is going to deal with that sometimes in a very strong way. Now, we need to, we need to take that to heart. And the reason He does it is because He loves us. He doesn't, I mean, he knows that our, for our ultimate good, we need to love him most of all. Now, one other thing I just want to say is this, that R.C. reminded us on Wednesday when we were looking at how to deal with suffering, that the Lord brings suffering for many reasons, okay? It's not just for discipline. That's what Spurgeon was talking about here. He was talking about discipline. It isn't always because we love something more. But it's, it is always meant to teach us something. It is the Lord's instruction. Um, that's how he makes us grow, is through suffering. But sometimes it is because we love something more. And the point is we need to love him most. And so that's what he is intending to get our focus on, to love him and to be devoted to him as Jesus was. Well, may the Lord... Grant us grace, may he help us as we've been reminded of this to set our hearts on putting those other loves to death putting, or putting them in their place, you know. Not all of them need to be put to death, of course, but certainly love for sin does. Those sins need to be put away. The people we love in this world, they, they need to be in the right perspective, right? And God needs to be first. May he grant us that grace. Well, let's, let's take a moment Oh, and bow in silent prayer, and let's ask the Lord to help us do that. And particularly as we come to the Lord's table where we're committing ourselves again to put Him first in everything. Okay, Let, let's pray.